I'm going to take you through a bit of a Cook's tour of regional NRM and our role in transformation and our role as an institution. And I'm going to do that in a number of ways. I wanted to put this into the context of the drivers of change, the drivers of innovation and transformation. Now, I'm not going to go through those because I think we had a great job from Steve this morning who actually had a much pithier summary of why we're being pushed in this direction and how we're being pushed in this direction. And the interesting thing is some really conservative people are putting this in front of us too. It's not just the, the doomsayers who are doing this. Um, I will pull out of that, by the way, a couple of quick points. The profitability push, the climate change issue and consumer expectation, because we will come back to some of those. So about regional NRM, now who here has had anything to do with the Natural Resource Management Organisation at a regional level? So a lot of you don't, okay. So I'll do a really quick introduction. This is actually a world leading innovative model, but in classic Aussie style, People say, well, it's been around a bit long now, hasn't it? And really, like, well, what's the point of this? Now, that might be a minister you talk to or it might be someone on the ground. But in fact, to actually establish integrated natural resource management or integrated catchment management across the whole of the continent is a remarkable thing. And other people around the world look at this model and go, wow, how did you do that? And that's fantastic. And actually learn and draw from it. We have 56 regional bodies. They're statutory and non-government, so local land services in New South Wales, the catchment management authorities in Victoria. And then, for example, we have NGOs in, in um, most of the other states. So quite complicated, but this is an important fact that I want you to hold on to. It's really variable and really diverse. And that's good for a whole bunch of reasons. But this collection of organisations help manage dispersed, dispersed resources across Australia in a way that is identified by Ostrom. And if you haven't read Ostrom, Nobel Prize winning economist, you should go and do so. It's a really important way of actually taking decision making down to people on the ground and putting it into a relevant context. We do that in all of these ways. So I won't go into all of those, but there are several points that are really important. One is multiple scales. We can work at multiple scales. And another one that I think is really crucial and that we've had a taste of across here is we integrate across multiple issues, multiple sectors, multiple landscapes and tenures, multiple land uses. So we are as much in the agricultural space with biosecurity and markets and consumer expectations as we are in the environment space, the ecology space, looking after our natural and social capital. So we're also as much in the community development space and looking after people and making sure people do have the skills and capacity to manage landscape and manage land. So okay, that was a really quick intro and, and it probably was quite theoretical. So I'm gonna come and give you some very specific examples of what we do and how we do it, but I'm gonna talk about them in regards to our role in innovation and transformation. So what do we do in this space? Well, we help catalyze others and enable them to innovate. We take innovations and we share them, we upscale them, we take them from a niche and, and, and share them out so they actually are bigger and, and, and um, more dramatic. We contribute to what is a national innovation system and the transformation that comes from that system of which we are all a part and of which you've heard from some of these people. But we also try and innovate us. So we're not only just trying to encourage others and sharing that around, we're, we're also obliged to say for a whole number of different reasons and pressures, sometimes government policy, how do we actually innovate and change ourselves? So I'm gonna give you a quick taste of all of this different examples of how we innovate. So they're different types of innovation, they come from right across the country. And by the way, I've left out some of my favorites, so if I have time, I might just drop them in as well. So new technology and tools is a classic. We've had some great interactions now with Geosciences Australia about Digital Earth Australia. Once again, go online, look at Digital Earth Australia. It's taking us into the 21st century with 30 years of remote sensing data that we can interrogate with new logarithms, ask new questions. It's just fantastic. We can actually manage to show you 30 years ago when we hadn't invested in this landscape right through to now and what's the difference. It's an amazing tool. And this is big data, this is remote sensing, this is all sorts of things. We do trialing and experimentation. So this is about, well, 
Victorian government wants offsets for water corporations. How can we actually do that? So we've run some fantastic work here in Victoria through the CMAs, actually looking at how do we manage to characterise quantitative measures, costs and revenues, and the narrative about what we're actually delivering. All of these I'm glancing across, so I can always give you more, more information. Another one that is really important and that takes us away from the data and the tools is the collaborative arrangements. And this is something that was really touched upon about institutions. This is where we can say, okay, well, we work at a regional scale, we have our regional strategy, and we work at that landscape scale, but what happens if you are working? You need to work across borders because of issues of water management or um, issues that are similar, such as across, uh, you know, across rangelands Australia. So this is where we've actually done some fantastic innovation where people have got together and they're not just working within their state, they're working across borders. So the Tri-State Alliance for part of the Murray-Darling, the, um, the Reef Alliance is a classic, Rangelands Alliance. This is a really important way of being responsive to an issue and to a stakeholder base because you can actually get together and you can change your level of focus and the institutions that you're working with. New markets and partners. Now this is another really exciting thing. This is coming out of Tasmania. And this is part of the joy of you know, being able to let the irony, a thousand flowers bloom, is the fact that you'll have someone who's totally into a particular idea somewhere else in the country, and they'll get stuck into that and they'll make that happen. And then as a whole, we all benefit from that. So in a sense, NRM regions are a fantastic breeding ground for innovation because of the diversity and the variability that we actually have. So this is a really quite surprising, coming out of you know, a, a small part of Tassie, a, a really high powered collaboration that's actually happening, that's got legs, and there's some really good stuff that's gonna be coming out of this. Bit more of a background that I won't go into detail about, but the interesting thing here that um, would be good to bring to your attention, and this relates back to some of Doug's talk this morning, is that the Chinese are really interested in tracing and provenance, and there are really important consumer expectations about what we market to them, and how we report that, and how we, do, how we actually do that. So there's some really important work happening there that comes back to the harsh reality of market access, international market access and value add. So we're not just talking uh, about the feel-good stuff, we're talking about the reality of the future of Australian agriculture. Then there's just some sexy new tools that, were, that people will pick up. So New South Wales have been experimenting with some st stuff that came through from the defence industry. Those two pigs there, and it doesn't show up very well on this screen, but basically you get much better success rate with your aerial shooting because you've got heat sensing and heat imagery that you can actually do, and you can tell the difference between a pig and anything else you might see. But this is about adopting across sectors. So this is from the, um, as I say, from defence. Additionally, we're interested in new products and the new partnerships that are required to do this. And this is a really exciting one, the Reef Credits Scheme, and Sheridan probably knows a lot more about this than me. But there are a number of reasons I've picked out this example. One is that it's a regional NRM body who's actually working with an environmental markets developer, Green Collar, and saying, how can we help farmers actually benefit, get a dollar benefit from doing the right thing by the reef? And we can do that through creating reef credits that are like carbon credits. You measure, as Sheridan was saying, you can make them verifiable, they're audited, and you can basically get a benefit for the landholder for doing the right thing. The other thing here is NAB have moved into that space. Now you'll know that NAB have been doing lots of work on, on natural capital, and there's some really good stuff happening here. So this is where the banks are starting to put their money on the table for helping us. Another one that we've got here, which is less exciting, but is, I think does follow on nicely from Sheridan's comment too about um, lack of capacity, is we get pressured a lot because we have 56 regional bodies. So you can go in and talk to a senior departmental person. They'll go, well, can't we just have one? Like, why do you need 56? And there can be a real lack of understanding about the fact that just like with Tom's discussion about you go out into a regional town and you see the impact of that abattoir and how that helps keep that town and that region ticking along, 
It's the same with the work that we do. We have to be connected in with communities. We have to be working hands-on with people. We have to have the trust and those relationships. Without that, what, you're going to send someone out from Canberra to actually talk to someone about why they have to change practice on farm? Or how you're going to work with threatened species? I mean, there's, this is a really important element of it. So with that pressure that we get, how are we responding? Well, this was a fantastic example up in the north where people said, well, let's, let's create a joint venture, put together all our corporate admin stuff and get our efficiencies that way. So they've actually established corporate nature. Look at the size of the country that those guys cover off on. Accountability improvement, okay, I'll really be, I'm going to leave that one aside, but this is quite an important one where years ago we looked at how the hell do we improve? I know, what are they doing internationally? Ah, they run performance excellence reviews. Let's actually run that process. You'll see on the left how we've been improving over time. That was something the Queenslanders came up with, and now most of us across Australia do that. National Environmental Economic Accounts. That's another example. We've run successful trials and we're looking at how can we nationally actually manage to have national environmental accounts. So you'll see I've done a quick cooks tour and I left out the Kakadu plum, bush food industry, sustainable wild harvest. Um, I've left out all sorts of exciting ones. The virtual fencing where we've been running trials in New South Wales because the Victorians aren't allowed to. Um, there's been all sorts of great stuff and that's been drawing upon CSIRO. But I've done that tour because I've wanted to give you that sense of the really different types of innovation and also how that's happening around the country and how it's been generated in such different ways. So what does this say about this model and what are the, what are the good aspects of this model that help make this happen? And it, it was a, quite a coincidence that Brian's summary actually pulled out some of those factors as to why I think you see theoretically, but then you see in practice, the innovation happening and hopefully leading to that transformation. So the variability that I talked about, the fact that we work with multiple issues, we work across sectors, we work for co-benefits, whether those are health outcomes, community development outcomes, agricultural profitability outcomes, etc. We're scalable. We work from we, can, we work from the soil in your hand to the paddock through up to a national and international level. We have very different strengths and weaknesses and we can really work on that. Partnerships are fundamental. Participation, so this is about meeting people in the middle. And that's a really important part of our role is we can broker, we can create that space where those different sectors come together and where you can create that trust and that room and we don't have to lead. We might be the person doing the backroom work to help with that capacity and help that partnership happen and to broker that. And that's crucial. And that's the intangible institutional stuff that we need. Okay, so moving on with this one, I wanted to say, well, what does this mean about our potential and future? And I've got about 55 seconds to do that. Well, what we're trying to do is not rest on our laurels. This is not enough. How do we create pathways for transformation? And I guess for us, part of it is the acknowledgement that we are part of a much bigger system. And that bigger system has to work properly. And that we need to actually manage to create a sense of what is our national system? What do we need to make that work properly? How do we make that happen? So we're working on, on pushing a better understanding at the national level of a framework for natural resource management and agriculture that we can actually invest in and create the different, different parts of and the different entities. I'm going to stop there before Rowan gets ugly. But I do want to say, I think <laughs> there, is, there is a big question here about what actually is transformation. When has something actually transformed and how long does that take? And I am going to throw in just a, a, one last point. And this to me is this issue that comes up in all the literature about direction. And I, I think the pogo stick cartoon is a brilliant one. So you could look at that and say, that person innovated, that's fantastic. But they innovated in the wrong direction. And so I think we need to, be, we need to bring to our discussion the sophistication of being able to say that innovation for innovation's sake, transformation for transformation's sake is not enough. There has to be a sense of direction and understanding we're heading somewhere. And breaking something and selling the company to use the Uber model is not going to work in agriculture and the environment. 
We have to protect our natural and social capital. We can't break things and move on, having sold it for a lot of money. We're in it for the long haul. So our innovation and transformation models have to take that into account. They have to consider direction and they have to consider timescale. Okay, thank you everyone.